Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an analysis of the Hindu newspaper from UPSC perspective. Today we will discuss the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 26 November 2019. And the articles that we will discuss are displayed on your screen. So let us start our discussion. Now this lead article on page number 10 talks about an issue that is related to the Indian constitution. And in this article the author has highlighted the various causes and reasons for the longevity and the stability of the Indian constitution. And this article has been written in the context of the constitutional day that we are celebrating today. And it was on 26 November 1949 that the Indian Constituent Assembly adopted and enacted this constitution. And as this constitution of India has survived for more than 70 years, the author has provided various arguments in favor of this stability and the longevity of Indian constitution. And this debate regarding the longevity and the stability of the Indian constitution started at the time of the formulation of Indian constitution itself. And at that point, one of the biggest critique of Indian constitution, Sir Ivor Jennings had described the Indian constitution as being too long, too rigid and too prolix. Now what prolix means is that any speech or writing which contains too many words and is lengthy in nature. Further, Sir Ivor Jennings declared that the Indian constitution was too large too rigid and was caged by its history, which means that it had huge hangover of its history and the colonial background. And accordingly, he further stated that it was too difficult to mold such a constitution through the use of judicial interpretations. So in short, his overall judgment regarding the Indian constitution was that this constitutional document of India would not survive for too long. And that was mainly because of the way in which the Indian constitution was formulated. However, as we all know that the Indian constitution, as against the prediction of the constitutional expert Ivor Jennings, has survived for more than 70 years. Now, it is interesting to note that Sir Ivor Jennings, who was a constitutional expert at that time, was commissioned to write the new constitution for Sri Lanka, which was known as Ceylon at that point. However, despite Sir Ivor Jennings being a constitutional expert, that constitution of Sri Lanka did not survive for more than six years. So in this background, the author has presented a work of the University of Chicago, which is titled The Lifespan of Written Constitutions. And this work is related to the longevity of the constitutions world over. And this study of the University of Chicago has identified that there are 792 new constitution systems in world. And out of these 792 constitutions, 518 have been replaced by new constitutions. Further, 192 constitutions out of these 792 are still in force and 82 have been formally suspended and have been replaced by new ones. So this study in short highlights that not many constitutions have survived for long time and there has not been much stability in various constitutions across the world. So in short, this study analyzes how do constitutions survive for a longer period of time and what are the reasons for the stability and the longevity of any constitution and further this study has further highlighted the various points and aspects related to the stability in the Indian constitution and accordingly the author has further highlighted why did the Indian constitution survive for this long. So first let us look at how the constitution survive for a longer period of time as highlighted by the work of University of Chicago. And after that, we will look at the reasons for the stability and the longevity of Indian constitution and how has the Indian constitution survived for this long. And regarding the points for Indian constitution stability, we will look at some of the chapters of NCRT which highlight these points in detail. Now the point regarding the stability and the longevity of the constitutions which has been raised in this article has also been provided in the NCRT of class 11th of political science and the name of this NCRT is Indian Constitution at Work and in its chapter Constitution as a Living Document it has argued that are the Constitution static and in this this chapter has provided various examples of different constitutions across the world which have undergone various changes for example this chapter highlights that the Soviet Union had four constitution in its life for 74 years. That is the first constitution was adopted in 1918. 
and it underwent a change in 1924, 36 and 77. And finally after 1971 when the USSR disintegrated a new constitution was adopted by the Russian Federation in the year 1993. So this shows that in a mere period of 70 years Russia had to change its constitution and four constitutions were adopted. Similarly if you look at the history of France it has had numerous constitutions in the last two centuries as has been highlighted by this NCRT. So after the French Revolution in the year 1793 France adopted its first constitution and it came to be known as the first French Republic. However the French constitution again underwent a change and a new constitution was adopted in 1848 and that was called as second French Republic. Then again the third French Republic was formed with a new constitution in 1875 and in 1946 a new constitution was formed and it was known as the fourth French Republic and finally in the year 1958 the fifth French Republic came into being. So this shows that the nations rewrite their constitutions in response to the changed circumstances or change of ideas within the society or due to various political upheavals. However if we look at the Indian constitution it was adopted on 26 November 1949. However more than 70 years have passed and the same constitution continues to function as the framework within which the government of our country operates. So this highlights that the constitutions across the world have been changing and have been rewritten at times. However the Indian constitution has remained stable and has worked for such a long period of time. So after this let us look at the points which have been highlighted by the author regarding the reasons why the constitution survive for a longer period of time. Now the first reason for the survival of a constitution for a longer period of time is the specificity of the constitutional document. Secondly, the inclusiveness of the constitution's origin and the constitution's ability to adapt to the changing conditions are important for the longevity. as has been highlighted by the study of university of chicago now regarding the specificity of the indian constitution you should note that it provides for detailed provisions for the administration and as you might have studied it provides detailed provisions for center state relations how both the governments at the central level and at the state level are going to raise taxes and also what are the various fields on which center and the states have their right for legislation further it also provides for the resolution of interstate river water disputes and all these aspects highlight that our indian constitution provides for specific provisions for different issues and that is why our constitution is more precise secondly it notes that the inclusiveness of the constitution's origin is important for the survival of a constitution for longer period of time now we note that during the formulation of indian constitution the constituent assembly members were selected by the provincial assemblies and the members of these provincial assemblies were in turn elected by the members of these provinces and that is why it represented a inclusive nature in the formulation of the indian constitution and the third point is that the constitution's ability to adapt to changing conditions are important for the longevity now we note that indian constitution provides for the amendment of the indian constitution under the article 368 and the amendment procedure which has been provided under the article 368 has been described as a mixture of rigidity and flexibility and that has been one of the important condition for the longevity of the indian constitution and that is because indian constitution has changed itself and adapted itself to the changing times and the needs of the times The second point which has been raised by this article is that the constitutions whose provisions are known and accepted will more likely be self enforcing and because the acceptability is essential to resolving the coordination problems. So in short it has been highlighted by those constitution whose provisions are known that is they are known to the people of the country and are accepted by various sections of the society. And this faith in the Indian constitution has been reposed by almost all sections of the Indian society and that was reflected in the way it was formulated by the different members of the society which were represented in the constituent assembly third point is that the constitutions that are ratified by public reference enjoy higher levels of legitimacy 
So this simply shows that there should be high acceptance of the constitution by the public itself. And the constitution should not be imposed by a smaller section of the society on the other sections. Fourth point is that the constitutional durability increases with the level of public inclusion both at the stage of drafting and also at the approval stage. And again this is reflected in the constituent assembly and the way in which the constitution was formulated. And finally the only way in which the constitution should be interpreted is through a court which is empowered with the powers of constitutional judicial review. And we note that in India's case the Supreme Court has enriched the Indian constitution by various constitutional judicial reviews. And we note that in the 1973 in the Keswananda Bharti case the Supreme Court had given the basic structure doctrine and which provided that the parliament can amend any part of the Indian constitution except the basic structure of the Indian constitution. So these points were highlighted by the study of the University of Chicago which highlighted that these are the reasons for the survival of a constitution for a longer period of time. Now after that let us look at the reasons which were provided by this study for the Indian constitution's survival for a longer period of time. Now why did the Indian constitution survive? So this study highlighted that the Indian diversity produced constitutional stability and that is mainly because no single group could dominate the other groups which means that there is no hegemony of any one group on the Indian constitution's functioning. And this diversity of India is reflected in terms of its linguistic diversity, its regional diversity and its religious diversity. And because of this diversity, no one group can dominate the other. And that is why it has been one of the reason for the stability of the Indian constitution. Further, this study of University of Chicago highlighted that longer constitutions are more durable than the shorter ones. And that is mainly because longer constitutions provides for specific provisions for specific matters. And that is why there is lack of ambiguity due to these specific matters. And this does not create confusion on various issues. So as the Indian constitution is lengthy in nature and it provides clarity on various administrative aspects also that is why that is one of the reasons for the survival of Indian constitution for this long. And finally it has been argued that the constitutions work best when they are most like ordinary statutes. Further if they are relatively detailed and are easy to modify. So all these three are visible in the Indian constitution because because most of the provisions of the Indian constitution are relatively detailed and they are reflected in the number of articles that are present in the Indian constitution. So when the Indian constitution was adopted in 1949, it contained about 395 articles. And as such, it contained various provisions related to the principles of governance and detailed administrative provisions. Further, the way in which it could be modified further was provided under the article 368 and this article has been described to be providing Indian constitution a good mix of rigidity and flexibility. So in short the Indian constitution is not as rigid as the American constitution and it is not also that flexible like that of the British constitution and thus it reflects a good synthesis of both rigidity and flexibility. And that has also been one of the reason for the survival of the Indian constitution for more than 70 years. Now the two questions that emerge out of this discussion is that does the Indian constitution represent the will of the people? That is if the constitution is representative in nature or not. And secondly has the constitution evolved over the time? That means has the constitution adapted itself with the changing times and the needs of the time? So we will try and answer these questions by using the various aspects that have been discussed in the NCRTs. Now if you go through the democratic politics NCRT of class 9th, you will find a chapter on constitutional design. And this chapter raises the question that why should we accept the constitution made by assembly or the constituent assembly more than 6 decades ago. So this NCRT answers the question of acceptability of the Indian constitution which was made or prepared six to seven decades ago. And it highlights that the constitution did not reflect or does not reflect the views of the members of constituent assembly alone. 
and it expresses a broad consensus of its time. Now, various countries had to rewrite their constitutions as we have seen earlier. And that was mainly because some of the rules or the provisions of these constitutions were not acceptable to all the major social groups or the political parties. However, the way in which the Indian constitution has functioned is different. And in India's case, although several groups have questioned some provisions of the constitution, but no large social group or political party has ever questioned the legitimacy of the constitution itself. And that has been one of the achievements of the Indian constitution in its working in the past seven decades. Now, the second reason for the acceptance of the Indian constitution is that the constituent assembly represented the people of India. And in this line, it highlights that although the members of the constituent assembly were not elected by the universal adult franchise, and that is because the universal adult franchise was not available at that point of time. However, it was mainly constituted and elected by the members of the existing provincial legislatures. And this ensured a fair geographical share of members from all the regions of the country. And further, this assembly or the constituent assembly was dominated by the Indian National Congress. And we know that the Indian National Congress had led the India's freedom struggle. And again, regarding the diversity in the Indian National Congress, you should note that this Congress itself included a variety of political groups and opinions. Further, the members of the Constituent Assembly represented members from different language groups, different castes, classes, religions and the occupations. And that is why it has been asserted that even if the Constituent Assembly was elected by a universal adult franchise, its composition would not have been very different. So in short, the way in which the members of the Constituent Assembly were elected and also the members of the Constituent Assembly were representing diverse caste groups, class groups and linguistic groups and also religious groups. And that is why it was a diverse assembly. And that is why our constitution was able to accommodate the diversity of India. And that has also been one of the reasons for the stability of the Indian constitution in its past seven decades of functioning. Another reason for the survival of the Indian constitution for seven decades and more is the manner in which the constituent assembly worked and formulated the constitution. So in this regard, in the first case, some basic principles were decided and agreed upon by the drafting committee of the Indian constitution, which was led by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. And after that, several rounds of thorough discussion took place on this draft constitution. And this discussion took place clause by clause, which means that each and every aspect of the Indian constitution was well debated. And after these debates and discussion, more than 2000 amendments were considered. Further, various articles of the Indian constitution were deliberated for 114 days, which were spread over three years, which means that the constitution was not formulated in haste and ample amount of time was devoted for the formulation of the Indian constitution. And further, various debates and discussion on different articles have been preserved under the constant assembly debates. And these debates provide the rationale behind every provision of the Indian constitution and they are sometimes used to interpret the meaning of the constitution. And the Indian judiciary uses these constitutional debates to interpret the various aspects of the Indian constitution. So as the constitution of India had diverse representation, and secondly, the manner in which constitution was formulated was well debated and discussed. And that has led to the acceptability of the Indian constitution for such a longer period of time as compared to the other constitutions of the world. So the aspects that we have discussed from this NCRT reflect that the Indian constitution represents the will of the people. So after this, let us look at the second question that is, has the constitution of India evolved over time? And this aspect can be understood from the NCRT of class 11th, that is Indian constitution at work of the political science. And this highlights that our constitution accepts the necessity of modification according to the changing needs of the society. And in the actual working of the Indian constitution, there has been enough flexibility of interpretations. And both the political practice and the judicial rulings have shown maturity and flexibility in the implementation of the Indian constitution. 
and all these factors have made our constitution a living document rather than a closed and a static rule book. So these points highlight that the Indian constitution has evolved over a period of time and it has been able to meet the changing needs of the society over a period of time. And that is why this is also one of the reasons for the survival of Indian constitution. Now, how was the Indian constitution able to meet the changing needs of the society? So this aspect was considered and was provided in the manner in which the Indian constitution can be amended. And these aspects were provided under the article 368 of the Indian constitution. So the constitution of India can be amended in three ways. First is similar to the ordinary law that is by the simple majority in the parliament. Now, for example, for the withdrawal of boundaries of the states, it can be done through the simple majority of the parliament. Secondly, there are various provisions which require a special majority in parliament in both the houses separately. And in the third case, a special majority in the parliament in the both the houses is required separately and also a ratification by the legislatures of half of the states is required. And this condition is to be met while changing the various federal features of the Indian constitution. For example, at the time of implementation of GST, the amendment to the constitution required these conditions to be fulfilled. And as such, it required the ratification of legislatures of half of the Indian states. Now, if we compare the way in which Indian constitution can be amended with that of the provisions of amendment for the American constitution, we will find that in case of America, a constitutional convention is required for the amendment of the constitution. Secondly, in case of America, even the proposal for the amendment of the constitution can be initiated by the state legislatures, which is not a case in India. And in case of America, when the consent of the state legislatures is required, it should be of the three-fourth of the total states and not like India, where the consent of only half of the states is required. So these aspects highlight that although Indian constitution provides for certain amount of rigidity in its amendment, it also provides certain amount of flexibility as compared to that of the US constitution. So again here you can see that the two principles dominate the various procedures of amending the constitution in modern constitution. First is through the principle of special majority and this has been provided in the constitutions of US, South Africa and Russia. And in case of the constitution of US, the special majority required is that of two-thirds of the majority. While in case of South Africa and Russia, the majority should be of three-fourths of the members of the parliament. So in short, this highlights that the amendment procedure which was provided in the constitution at the time of its formulation provided enough amount of rigidity and flexibility to the Indian constitution. And besides the amendment procedure which was provided under Article 368, the basic structure doctrine has played a key role in the evolution of Indian constitution. And we note that this basic structure doctrine was formulated in the famous Keswananda Bharti case of 1973. So what has been the contribution of this verdict of basic structure in the Keswananda Bharti case? The first is that it has set specific limits to the parliament's power to amend the constitution and it says that no amendment can violate the basic structure of the Indian constitution. Secondly, it allows the parliament to amend any and all parts of the constitution within the limitation of basic structure. And finally, it places the judiciary as the final authority in deciding if an amendment violates the basic structure and what constitutes the basic structure. And as we have seen in this article that the only way in which the interpretation of the constitution can be done should be through the procedure of judicial review by the courts. And that has been the practice in case of India. And this has led to the evolution and formulation of basic structure doctrine, which has contributed to the stability and flexibility in the Indian constitution. And regarding the various features of the basic structure doctrine, and how this doctrine has played a key role in the survival of the Indian constitution, we have discussed one question from the mains examination of 2019 in the DNS of 12th November 2019. So you can go through this discussion to understand the various aspects of the basic structure doctrine in detail. Further, you should go through both these chapters of the NCRT of class 9th and that of class 11th to understand the various aspects of the Indian constitution in detail. 
And with this, let's take up the next article. Now, this editorial on page number 10 is related to the recent elections that were held in the Hong Kong in its district council elections. And we note that the Hong Kong has been witnessing various protests which are termed as the pro-democracy protest. Now, in these district council elections, the protesters had seeked a vote for democratic change. Now, in these elections, the clash was basically between the candidates who were supported by the establishment of the Hong Kong and which was in turn supported by the Chinese government. And against these candidates which were supported by the establishment of Hong Kong were the candidates who were supported by the pro-democracy protesters. And as such, these elections were being seen as a referendum on the pro-democracy protests that were going on in Hong Kong. Now, according to the results, the pro-democracy parties have captured 17 district councils out of the total 18 district councils that went to the election. And out of the 452 election candidates in these district councils, the pro-democracy parties have won around 392 seats. And the candidates who were supported by the establishment or the parties who were supported by the present establishment of the Hong Kong, their number has reduced from 292 to only 60 seats in the present elections. So this has marked the victory for the pro-democracy protesters in the recent district council elections. So in this background, what we will do is that we will look at the reasons why the Hong Kong was witnessing protests in the past, what was the history of it, and what is the relevance of Hong Kong for India. And all these can be important for us from General Studies Paper 2 under the topic International Relations. Now we have covered these issues in detail in one of the previous DNS videos. So what we will be doing is that we will be embedding that video for improving your understanding on the current situation in Hong Kong. And what are the interests of India in the Hong Kong? So first let us look at the Hong Kong issue from the historical perspective. So here it should be understand that the Hong Kong was acquired by Britain after defeating China in the Opium War. And this Opium War between China and Britain started because the Qing dynasty in China attempted to crack down on the illegal opium trade which was leading to widespread addiction in the China. So after being defeated by the Britain in 1842, China agreed to cede the island of Hong Kong to British in perpetuity through a treaty known as the Treaty of Nanjing. And over the next half century, UK took control of other neighboring islands of Hong Kong, which is known as the present day Hong Kong. And finally, in 1898, through a convention, the Hong Kong territory was leased to Britain for 99 years. And under the terms of this treaty, China would regain the control of the leased islands on July 1st, 1997. Now, as the British relations with the Hong Kong territory date back to 1840s, similarly, because India was a part or a colony of the British Empire, that is why India's relations with the Hong Kong also date back to this period of 1840s. So, before the end of this 99-year lease, the Britain and China signed a joint declaration on the future of Hong Kong in the year 1984. And under this joint declaration, a new system of administration was to be designed for Hong Kong. And this was known as one country and two systems approach. Now under this system, this British controlled territory was handed over to China and the Chinese sovereignty extended to Hong Kong. However, the territory of Hong Kong retained its original political and economic system. And regarding this, the political process in Hong Kong was to be guided according to the province's basic law. Now this system of Hong Kong has two special features. The first is that the socialist system and the policies that are being practiced in China will not be extended to Hong Kong. And this Hong Kong special administrative region will have the same capitalist system which it has been practicing for past 50 years. And this will be the way of life in Hong Kong for coming next 50 years. Now besides the capitalist system that will be practiced in Hong Kong, there will be a chief executive who will be the highest representative leader in Hong Kong. And he shall be selected by election or through the consultations held locally and will be appointed by the Central People's Government of China. Now here it is to be understood that the person who will stand for the elections of the chief executive will be first nominated by a nominating committee. 
and these nominations are presently being done by the central government of china so after the candidates for the chief executive are nominated by the chinese government these people stand for elections and one of them is appointed as the chief executive after the election process through the universal adult suffrage in hong kong so in short china nominates who will stand for this position however the final selection or election for the chief executive is done through the voting from the people of hong kong now after this let us look at the current position and significance of hong kong so in this line let us first understand the geographical significance of the location of hong kong for china now the hong kong forms a part of the pearl river delta metropolitan region where the pearl river flows into south china so as you can see in this map the hong kong is located at the mouth of south china sea further it is the wealthiest region in south china and the largest urban area in the world in both size and population further it includes major economic centers such as the gonzo the shenzhen macau etc and its gdp is at 1.2 trillion dollar which makes it the largest economic region in southeast asia which is even more than indonesia so it has economic significance and besides this it has the location which is very important for china and this is because it opens into the south china sea now let us understand why are protests going on in the hong kong and what is the present cause of tension between china and the hong kong so first is related to the election of the chief executive in the hong kong now as we have learned that the chinese government nominates the individuals who can stand for the chief executive in hong kong Now in this background the China wants its control on the nomination process wherein China nominates only pro Chinese government individuals that do not critique the Chinese policies in Hong Kong now the protesters or the activists are pro democracy and they want a more direct election process in Hong Kong and they want that there should be no interference or control of China on the elections of chief executive of Hong Kong now before 1997 the economic scenario was very different and at that point of time hong kong was the main investor in the mainland china however presently after 20 years the situation has now changed and china has become a economic superpower and that is why the chinese control over the hong kong is increasing economically day by day further another cause of tension between china and hong kong is related to the cultural differences between hong kong and china now the people in mainland china are mandarin speaking however the hong kong is a cantonese speaking region so the languages in both these regions is different so they are linguistically very different and which shows the cultural differences between china and hong kong and finally the hong kong considers itself culturally distinct from china like other countries of the indo china region so the issues are mainly related to the election system of the chief executive of hong kong wherein the interference of china has increased and china wants to retain its control on the nomination process so that they can appoint a person who is pro china and by that they can indirectly control the hong kong's government and as against this the protesters are demanding that the process of election of the chief executive should be democratic in nature and there should be no interference of china in this process now after this let us understand what is the issue which has been raised in this article in the newspaper now as we all know that hong kong is currently witnessing a anti government and pro democracy protest now this is because recently a bill has been introduced in the hong kong which will allow the courts in hong kong to extradite any person to mainland china now if this bill is passed it will allow china to legally take actions against anti china activists so what would happen is that if anybody is protesting in hong kong against the chinese government it will provide the powers to the hong kong courts to extradite or send that person to mainland china for his legal trial and that is how the chinese government seeks to control these protests in hong kong further china has also hinted that they will use their army which is known as the people's liberation army to quell or control the protests in hong kong however the author has raised the concern that this will lead to a similar fallout as the tiananmen square incident in 1989 now about this incident you will read in your world history and in these protests at the tiananmen square in china in 1989 china used its army and this led to the killing of thousands of pro democracy protesters in china
and finally let us look at the india hong kong relations now in this line you should note that india respects and follows the one nation two system policy between china and hong kong now both china and the hong kong follow two separate economic systems and in this line india has signed separate agreements with china and with hong kong so in this background india has signed the double taxation avoidance agreement with the hong kong now since hong kong has always had liberal economic policies it has always acted as a gateway to china for the companies in the rest part of the world now what this means is that various companies of the world used to invest in hong kong and through hong kong they used to invest in china now with rapid growth and engagement between the chinese and the indian economies now the hong kong is also acting as a gateway to india this is because india has signed a double taxation avoidance agreement with hong kong and that is why many chinese companies are routing their investments into india through the hong kong further hong kong is a major re-exporter of the items it imports from india into the mainland china now india is hong kong's third largest export market destination after china and us and also Hong Kong is India's third largest export market after US and UAE. Further, Hong Kong occupies 12th position in the FDI equity inflows into India in the year 2018. So this shows that Hong Kong remains a very important partner for India as far as economy is concerned. Further, India has had cultural engagement with Hong Kong and it should be noted that Hong Kong has for more than 150 years been home to a large Indian community. And this Indian community in Hong Kong has contributed to the oldest university in Hong Kong, which is known as the Hong Kong University. And several Hong Kong based persons of Indian origin have been awarded by the Pravasi Bharti Samman Award. So all these things highlight that India has got important economic as well as cultural relations with the Hong Kong. So all these aspects show that India has had very good economic relations with the Hong Kong and it is a, one of the important economic partners for India. And if due to Chinese intrusions, the Hong Kong economy is impacted, it will have repercussions for Indian economy as well. So these are few aspects of the Hong Kong protests and what are the issues that are going on in Hong Kong. With this, let's move to the next article. Now, this article on page number 10 talks about a new global target which has been released by the World Bank to reduce the learning poverty by half by the year 2030. So, this topic becomes important for us from General Studies Paper 2 under the subtopic Social Justice. So, in this article, what we will try to do is understand what is meant by this term learning poverty and how does learning poverty affect the individual as well as the society. And further, we will look at the various steps that have been taken by the Indian government to alleviate this learning poverty. So now the World Bank has announced the target of reducing this learning poverty by half by the year 2030. So in this context, what is meant by this term learning poverty? So regarding this, you should note that it is defined as the inability of 10 year old children to read and understand a simple text. Now you might be knowing that the government of India till now has only been focusing on increasing the enrollment in its school through the Right to Education Act. However, this has not resulted in the improved ability of its children to read and understand simple text. And this has been highlighted by various studies in the past. So simply you should understand that the learning poverty indicates a combination of type of schooling and also the various learning outcome indicators. Now regarding school, you should note that how many of the children of a country are enrolled in a school and till what age do they pursue their education? And secondly, what are the learning outcomes of this schooling in these countries? For example, are these students able to read and understand simple texts or stories, etc. And according to UNESCO data, Almost 53% of all the children in low and middle income countries suffer from this learning poverty. So in this context, let us understand the impact of learning poverty at individual level and at societal level. So in this background, this article has highlighted the importance of reading and understanding of a text for the individual. 
and accordingly reading is the key foundation to other foundational skills for example numeracy that is understanding of various number systems secondly it improves the reasoning and is also important and foundational skill for various socio emotional skills secondly the education is directly related to higher productivity economic competitiveness employment health and better civic engagement so these are established facts and outcomes of educated individuals in a country now if a person of a deprived section of the society is educated it can improve his or her chances of moving or climbing into the social hierarchy and that is why it improves or it is a pathway to the social mobility now regarding the impact of learning poverty at the societal level the article says that the learning crisis in the formatting years is the leading cause of low levels of human capital formation and this human capital formation has been calculated by world bank through one of its indicators that is human capital index further such a learning crisis caused by the learning poverty undermines the sustainable growth and poverty reduction targets of a country and also this has huge economic costs for the countries now if you go through the ncert of class 11th of geography that is the human geography in its chapter number 4 related to human development you will find the works of nobel laureates dr mehboob ul haq and professor amarth sen now dr mehboob ul haq is a pakistani economist and he was the one who created the human development index in the year 1990 and according to him the development is all about enlarging people's choices in order to lead long and healthy lives with dignity and accordingly the un development program has used this concept of human development to publish the human development report annually since 1990 so this human development index which was created by dr mehboob ul haq has been used by the undp further nobel laureate professor amarth sen saw an increase in the freedom or a decrease in the unfreedom as the main objective of development and according to him increasing freedoms is also one of the most effective ways of bringing out development now as both dr mehboob ul haq and professor amarth sen have stressed on increasing the choices of the people and increasing the freedom of the people and accordingly they have defined the approach for development as capability approach and this approach is associated with professor amarth sen and he further highlights that building human capabilities in the areas of health education and access to resources is the key to increasing human development mm -hmm. and accordingly this highlights the importance of education for the development as has been defined under the capability approach which was given by professor amarth sen now as we have learned that the learning poverty in the formative years is the leading cause of low levels of human capital formation let us look at what is this human capital index and also the human development index which was created by dr mehboob ul haq and if you go through the prelims compass of the economic development you will find the difference between the hdi and the hci and what are the key aspects of the human capital index and both can be extremely important for us from the preliminary examination point of view so regarding the human development index you should note that it is measured by the un development program however the human capital index is measured and released by the world bank further this human development index is a summary measure of the average achievement in the key dimensions of human development and these include a long and healthy life being knowledgeable and having a standard of or a decent standard of living so in short it measures the present level of human development however as far as this human capital index is concerned it measures the amount of human capital that a child born today can expect to attain by the age of 18 years so as compared to the human development index it is more of a potential or the future level of human development which can be expected from the investment in education and health and that is why the world bank has decided to remove this learning poverty by half by the year 2030 and that is because it is important for human capital formation now what are the parameters that are used in calculating the hdi so it includes the life expectancy index which is measured by the life expectancy at birth 
it includes education index which is measured by expected years of schooling and mean years of schooling and thirdly it includes the standard of living which is measured by per capita income now here it should be noted that the HDI did not include the quality of learning as a parameter in the calculation of human development index now compared to this the three parameters for the human capital index include the survival which is measured by under 5 mortality expected years of quality adjusted school which is measured by both the quantity of education as well as the quality of the education and this quality is measured by a major international student achievement testing programs that includes the program for international student assessment that is PISA by the OECD and the quantity of education is measured by the number of years of school that a child can expect to obtain by the age of 18 and as far as the health environment is concerned it is measured by the adult survival rate and rate of stunting of children under the age of 5. So these are key points of comparison between the human development index and the human capital index. And according to the recent index, India has a human capital score of about 0.44 only and it ranks as low as 115 among the total 157 countries. Further, the global human capital score is only about 0.56. Now, as the human capital formation has been low across the world, which has been highlighted by this HCI or the human capital index, the World Bank has targeted to reduce the learning poverty by almost half by the year 2030. So in this regard, some of the suggestions which have been provided by the author for reducing the learning poverty is that the learners should be prepared and motivated to learn through the early childhood education, nutrition and stimulation. Secondly, teachers at all levels should be effective and valued. Schools should be safe and inclusive spaces. Classrooms should be well equipped for learning. And further, teaching children in the language they speak and understand is also important for reducing the learning poverty. Thirdly, ensuring timely access to more and better age and skill appropriate texts and the readers. And finally, assuring political commitment to literacy is also important. So these are some of the suggestions which have been provided by the author. Further, this article highlights the various steps that have been taken by India to reduce the learning poverty. And first in this case is that the Right to Education Act has increased the enrollment levels in the schools. However, now the focus has shifted towards improving the quality and accordingly, India has joined the PISA rankings of 2021 for the effective measurement of learning outcomes. And we have learned that the quality of education in the human capital index is calculated based on the studies of PISA. And this PISA is a global education evaluation system which is conducted by the OECD and it measures the reading literacy the science literacy and the numerical literacy. Further, India has launched the Samagra Shiksham program and it is an integrated scheme for school education from preschool to senior secondary level and it includes or subsumes the three schemes of Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, Rashtri Madhyamik Shiksha Abhiyan and the teacher education program. And the main emphasis of this program is on improving the quality of education by focusing on two T's that is teachers and technology. So these are a few aspects of this article and with this let's take up the next article. Now this article on page number 9 highlights a recent report which has been published by the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India and it has released the data on the enforcement norms of this authority. Now the three parameters on which the data has been released is that is the food unsafe or is it of substandard level and what are the labeling defects. Now earlier, the FSSI used to implement only the labeling defects. However, it is for the first time that it has used the unsafe and the substandard as the indicators for releasing this data. Now this data has been released in such a manner so that authorities can take precise and corrective and preventive action. And accordingly, the FSSAI analyzed various samples across the country and found that almost 15.8% of the food samples are of substandard level while 3.7 percent were unsafe and 9 percent were mislabeled during the year 2018 and 19 
and this becomes important for us from the preliminary examination point of view as a question has already been asked in the year 2018 related to the food safety and standards authority and the act according to which this body has been created so in this background let us look at some of the results of this data and why is this data important so the three parameters as we have learned are related to the unsafe samples second is the substandard samples and third is the labeling defects and on these parameters Tamil Nadu was the worst performer in terms of unsafe food and labeling defects as can be seen from this data that Tamil Nadu has performed miserably on the unsafe sample standards and the labeling defect standards however Nagaland had the most substandard products and all these has been highlighted by a study which was conducted by the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India now the foodborne disease burden epidemiology reference group of the world health organization has identified almost 31 foodborne hazards and this group has identified its first estimates of the incidence mortality and the disease burden due to the foodborne diseases and accordingly it has found that the foodborne diseases burden is comparable to that of major infectious diseases like the HIV AIDS malaria or tuberculosis and this highlights the importance of food safety and as various states in India are not performing well on various indicators like the substandard food quality the unsafe food quality and also various labeling defects it becomes important for us to implement the food safety and standards authority orders accurately and majority of the foodborne illness are caused by diarrheal diseases and further, these foodborne diseases affect the children under the age of 5 years. And according to WHO, almost 40% of the children under the age of 5 are suffering from these foodborne diseases. And that is why there is a need for urgent action by all stakeholders to improve food safety throughout the food chain with more coordinated efforts and greater focus. And in this background, let us look at the key aspects of the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India and key facts related to it. So regarding the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, you should note that it has been established under the Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006. And this act consolidates various acts and orders that were handling the food related issues in various ministries and department. And accordingly, this act has been created by subsuming various orders and also the prevention of food adulteration act of 1954 now regarding the establishment of the authority you should note that ministry of health and family welfare under the government of india is the administrative machinery for the implementation of food safety and standards authority of india further the chairperson and the chief executive officer of the fssai is appointed by the government of india directly and the chairperson is in the rank of secretary to the government of india now various functions of this Food Safety and Standards Authority of India have been provided under the Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006 and all these have been included in your PDF so you can go through them and understand them. Now if you go through this question which was asked in the year 2018 it reads consider the following statements. First is that the Food Safety and Standards Act 2006 replaced the prevention of Food Adulteration Act of 1954 which is correct as we have learned and the second is that this authority that is FSSAI is under the charge of Director General of Health Services in the Union Ministry of Health and Family Welfare which is incorrect because although it is under the administration of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare it is not under the charge of Director General of Health Services and that is because the chairperson of this FSSAI is appointed directly by the government of India. So the correct answer was A that is one only. With this, let's take up the next article. Now, in this article on page number 6, the central government has recommended a biodiversity study of a proposed dam in the Arunachal Pradesh. And this dam was proposed to be constructed in the Dihang district or the Dihang Valley district. Now, why was such a study required? This is because this zone where the dam was being constructed or was proposed to be constructed is one of the richest biogeographical province of the Himalayan zone. And that is why a fresh biodiversity study of this proposed dam has been recommended by the central government. So in this article from our preliminary examination point of view under the topic general issues on environment and biodiversity, 
Let us look at the key aspects of the Dihang Dibang Biosphere Reserve from our preliminary examination point of view. Now, if you go through the prelims compass of 2019 of the Environment and Ecology, you will find a list of the biosphere reserves of India. And in this, we have provided various aspects of these biosphere reserves. For example, the name of this biosphere reserve, if it has been included in the Man and Biosphere program of the UNESCO, where is it exactly located? Also, the important or the famous flora of this biosphere reserve, important fauna and the important tribal communities that live in these biosphere reserves. So accordingly, regarding the Hang Dibang Biosphere Reserve, you should note that it has not been included in the Man and Biosphere list or program of the UNESCO. Secondly, it includes parts of Upper Siang, West Siang and Dibang Valley districts of the state of Arunachal Pradesh in the northeastern part of India. So here you should note that the Mauling National Park is located in the Upper Siang district and is a part of this Dihang Dibang Biosphere Reserve. And regarding the important fauna of this Biosphere Reserve, it includes the Mishmi Takin, Red Goral, Musk Deer, Red Panda and the Asiatic Black Bear. So accordingly, you should go through this prelims compass of environment ecology to understand about the various other Biosphere Reserves of India and what are the important aspects of these biosphere reserves. And if you go through the preliminary examination questions of the year 2019, you will find that a question was asked related to the August Malay Biosphere Reserve. And if you would have gone through this list of biosphere reserves and their features, you would have easily answered that question of the year 2019's preliminary examination. Now after today's discussion, you should try these questions and the answer for them will be displayed after 5 seconds. The first question reads, which of the following biosphere reserves have been included in the Man and Biosphere program of UNESCO? So as you can see in the list, the Nanda Devi and Nokrek are included in the Man and Biosphere program. And hence the correct answer is B, that is 1 and 2 only. Second question reads, consider the following statements. First is that the basic structure doctrine is a part of Indian constitution, which is incorrect. And secondly, any part of the Indian constitution cannot be amended by simple majority of the parliament, which is also incorrect because... Some parts of the Indian constitution like the amendments related to the boundaries of the states etc. can be done by the way of simple majority of the parliament and hence the correct answer is D neither one nor two. And the third question is that the human capital index is released by which of the following and as we have learned it is released by the World Bank. With this we conclude today's discussion now let's take up the question for the day.